Hello and welcome to this week's Why Football podcast with me, Etches Adoku, and Michael Dryden. Dryden, how are you? Hello, Etch. Good to see you. I'm not bad. I'm going back to Sunderland on Sunday to see the family for a couple of weeks. Obviously, there'll be no football at the Stadium of Light. Oh, yeah? Why is that? Um, I think the League One season has been curtailed. Oh, We're in yeah. League One, I think. Yeah, yeah something like yeah. that. Um, it'd be nice to get out of London, though, I think, which isn't really the same in the COVID world. Mm. But hopefully, it's starting to ease. We're all on 2021, the Euros. Um, it's been painful missing it this year. Agreed. But how are you, Etch? Really good. Really, really good indeed. Uh, I've won the League on Pro Clubs. How many seasons did it take? Uh, we've played like 55 seasons, I think. 55 seasons? I think so, yeah. We've won the league three times. It's the third win. So in context, if we put that into real terms, you haven't won the league since like 1970. Well, yeah, we won the league yesterday. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, before that. Yeah, before that. Um, yeah, pretty good. So yeah, a bit of context. Pro Clubs is where you control one player on FIFA. Uh, on an earlier pod, I said I was uh, a centre back quite similar to Yap Stam. Yeah, I'm going to change that now because I play in midfield. I'm more like a young Clarence Seedorf. But are you playing more of a box to box, or yeah, kind of holding. I'm just the best player in the team. All oh, right, okay. So, um, yeah, fair enough. Apart from that, um, yeah, I actually dropped this new away kit like recently. Yeah, the white, kind the, of white, grey, grey yeah. kit. So I quite like to get that probably after this podcast. They always make really good kits, and I think. I wonder if that affects shirt sales that much because you get mm. some kits that come out that are so outrageous and just yeah. not that nice. I mean, Sunland had an old in I think 2016 to four wore it like green and yellow. Like, mm. surely you want to make it as nice as possible to sell <laughs> the shirts to make money. Like, I actually do it, and you always see them at gyms and like on runs because yeah. they're nice kits and people buy them. And I wonder if that actually does affect revenue in that regard. That's a topic for another pod. Because <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal's got Arsenal's got nice kits. Uh, I, mean, I actually, actually think their kits now are the nicest do. they've been. In years since yeah. the year two, your two shit from Marie. Yes, yeah, because we had Puma and Puma are awful. Mm. Yeah, Adidas are much much better. Today, Jordan will be looking at the journey of the Golden Goal Rule from its introduction in 1993 right through to its abolition in 2004, touching on its most memorable moments. Before we start, please follow us on Twitter at YFootball underscore for our latest content. Please also follow us and subscribe with us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and SoundCloud for immediate access to our future episodes. When was the Golden Goal Rule introduced and why? So FIFA and IFAB introduced the rule in 1993 to encourage more definitive conclusions to games rather than the traditional extra time and penalty shootout, although the rule was not compulsory. The rule was actually used in the North American leagues as early as the 1970s. The golden goal is used in NHL and we also have the golden point rule in NRL in Australia. IFAB, for those who don't know, is the International Football Association Board and interestingly are made up by FIFA, who control 50% of the voting rights, unsurprisingly. But the rest of the voting rights are made up of the four British home countries, which is interesting. So... The rest of that is split between English, Scottish, Welsh and the Northern Irish football associations. So lawmaking powers really do exist in Britain as well as around the world with the FIFA contingent. But they've got a significant share of the voting rights, which I found really interesting. And I didn't know before looking into it. So FIFA originally tested the rule in youth tournaments and competitions such as the Olympics and Confederations Cup. The first goal, first golden goal was scored in the 1993 World Youth Cup in Australia. It was first used in a major tournament in Euro 1996 and first year used in a World Cup at France 98. It's most remembered, as I think everyone will, will know, at Euro 2000 for reasons we'll come on to. Yeah, why do you have an unhealthy obsession with ice hockey? Well, you- I mean, I haven't got... A- much interested in any of the sports apart from football so I thought <laughs> yeah. so I, play, I used to play the video games and so I do have a little bit of interest yeah, in I, I know you play national the video hockey games. league is that a problem? Uh, no not at all it's just the, the shout out to NHL and a bit above is you know, a bit a bit west but we'll leave it there <laughs> um, it's interesting like, I wonder why it was seen as a better solution to extra time penalties I guess it is a bit more exciting in theory um, but then it's also equally as frustrating if you concede really quickly, like because it's just over. Yeah, it prevents um, a team from rectifying that error. Yeah, um, which I'll, I'll come on to when we go into the abolition. But it's, it, yeah, it really divided uh, football, the football community for a long period, 
What are the famous golden goals that were scored in this period? So in the Euro 96 final, a golden goal was scored by Oliver Bierhoff, that many people will remember, German player, in a 1-0 after extra time win um, against Czech Republic. A shot that was fumbled by Pete Peter Kuba, um, and it resulted in the Czech players appearing confused before realising their fate at the golden goal had actually ended the tournament um, with a victory for the Germans on uh, English soil. The rest of that tournament, uh, the extra time periods were marred by negative football. Interestingly, so come on to your point that you mentioned, because obviously the, the risk of attacking and leaving yourself vulnerable to conceding that golden goal and ending your tournament, you know, it's such a pinnacle of your career and pinnacle for the nation, um, is so great that you, you know it resulted in teams just sitting back and kind of waiting for that team to come onto them to open up an opportunity, which has created negative football. Laurent Blanc scored the first and only golden goal of France 98 against Paraguay in the last 16. At Euro 2000, with a semi-final between Portugal and France locked at one all, France rewarded a late extra time penalty following a deliberate handball by Abel Javier. Zidane put it in top right corner, as he does, um, against the Portugal team that featured the likes of Luis Figo and Rui Costa. In the final, France had been trailing 1-0 thanks to a Marco Del Vecchio goal and only equalised in stoppage time of normal time through a low Sylvain Wiltord drive. As we all know, in extra time, David Trezeguet hit a sweet half volley into the roof of the net beyond Francesco Toldo following a Maisie Robert Perez run and then cut back to win the tie and the tournament. So another interesting use of the rule was the 1994 Caribbean Cup where the organisers opted that not only would we have the golden goal rule in knockout stages, we would have golden goal rule in the group stages and it would count twice. So (laughs) what ensued was, so Barbados uh, were leading 2-1 in the game against Granada, but required a deficit, sorry, a lead of two to go through the group stages. So at 2-1, they scored a late own goal to make it 2-2 and then eventually scored in extra time to make it 4-2 and uh, therefore they went through the group stages into the knockout rounds um, on goal difference. Well, <laughs> all of those goals that you mentioned kind of came before I was watching football properly. I think uh, around the time of Euro 2000, I was heavily involved in Dragon Ball Z. Oh, nice. Yeah, greatest TV show on earth, um, <laughs> rather than football. I have seen the Trezeguet goal, though, um, because you know the Pires run and the finish and it, it being so famous but I'm actually surprised that so few games are actually decided by it I was expecting um, a few more of note mm. well what's interesting as well is that I don't actually know anything about Euro 2000 like when I was doing this and going through the research like I know so little about that tournament about what England's exploits were um, and yeah so what also came to light was the fact that the golden goal was largely uh, untested at times because teams were playing so negatively yeah all of these examples are from international matches. Were there any notable club golden goals? So yeah, most of the high-profile examples do come at international level, um, but we do have a significant number of club examples. First example in British domestic football was um, the Classico, that was the Auto Windscreen Shield Final, which is the Football League trophy, um, <laughs> where Paul Tate scored a 103rd minute glancing header for Birmingham um, against Carlisle to uh, win that competition. Galatasaray beat Real Madrid in the 2000 UEFA Super Cup with an extra time finish from Mario Jardel and a golden goal decided the 2001 UEFA Cup final between Liverpool and Alaves when Delphi Gellis converted a Gary McAllister free kick into his own goal to score what I believe is the only high profile own, own golden goal or golden own goal, <laughs> so should I say. So yes, yeah, so the, the level of examples really are on the same um, level in terms of volume and perhaps world stage, but some significant examples. Yeah, that Alaves game was like something like 5-4, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Johan Cruyff Jr. Mm-hmm. was in the Alaves ranks, I believe. Yeah, he was. He scored uh, the equaliser. I do. Yeah. Oh, the, it was either the third or the fourth goal of Alaves before it went to extra time. Yeah, very decent. Um, Mircea Luchescu uh, was the manager of Porto then. He then went over to take over at Shakhtar. There is a podcast on Shakhtar's Brazilians, if any of you are interested. <laughs> By Y Football. By Y Football, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Not just generally. Not just generally. So no. please see the BBC website. <laughs> and uh, Galatasaray actually beat Arsenal on penalties in the UEFA Cup final. So for them to have been a strong Arsenal team at that time, 
and to have beaten Real Madrid in the Super Cup, there must have been a pretty decent outfit. Mm, absolutely. When was the rule last used and why was it abolished? So the last World Cup the rule featured in was the 2002 World Cup in Japan and South Korea. Three games were decided, including South Korea's famous round of 16 victory over uh, Italy. Um, interestingly about that, An Jun Juan, who scored a header, and that would be a terrible pronunciation, but mm. who scored the header in that game, played for Perugia. And immediately after the game, the Perugia uh, president terminated his contract. That's outrageous. Um, and I believe he tried to go back on it. Um, Goose Hiddink, who was manager of South Korea at the time, was in uproar, as you would be. Mm. Um, because apparently, according to the Perugia president, um, the header had undermined or disrespected Calcio. So, interesting logic there. Henri Camera also scored a goal and goal in the, in the round of 16 stage for Senegal against Sweden, the 2 1 victory for the Senegalese. Turkey defeated Senegal, actually, then in the quarterfinals when Ilhan Manzi scored what would be the final goal in male tournaments to take Turkey through to the semi final. Majority of the footballing community felt the rule had not achieved its intended result of making extra time uh, more exciting and dramatic. There was no incentive to attack, as I've touched on, against a team who was set up defensively, as losing the ball could result in a costly counter-attack. Um, so it, it very much was seen as you set yourself up for failure if you're bombing men forward against a team that's mm. set up behind the ball, like a Mourinho part of the bus team, for then them to counter, to score and to win the game. Could also It was also seen as unfair that, say, a fortuitous goal or more referee mistake would immediately end the match and not give the other team an opportunity to rectify that. Obviously, that could still happen in extra time if in the 117th minute a goalkeeper makes an error or a goal is fortuitous or a referee makes an error. That results in a goal. They've only got a few minutes to rectify it. But it does seem very harsh and it was perceived as being very harsh that that game would actually just end mm. and the tournament would be over for the losing team. In current football, VAR could perhaps rectify that because you'd have to stop much in play. It would be reviewed and that would make a more fair um, assessment. But obviously at the time, VAR was not um, a thing. And the law never once decided the outcome of a Champions League match, um, as an example, um, even though it was used in club sports and club competitions um, throughout that period, as we've touched on with the UEFA Super Cup and the UEFA Cup in general. So in 2002, the silver goal was trialled in club competitions and was actually utilised in year 2004, which I completely, um, <laughs> completely didn't realise. Um, the only times that only time that was prominent, or we saw examples of that, was Ajax qualified for the 2003-2004 Champions League with a penalty silver goal against Austrian side GK in a qualifying match. And actually, Greece beat Czech Republic in the semi-final of that tournament, year 2004, and thanks to a silver goal by Trianos Delas, the only goal of his international career. <laughs> Interestingly nice. enough, good fact. Oh, uh, oddly the. IFAB announced prior to the tournament that both the silver goal and the golden goal would be removed from the tournament, which I find odd that you would then go ahead with using the rule, mm. saying that it's not fit for purpose, but we'll use it in the tournament anyway. <laughs> Since the 2006 FIFA World Cup, when neither of these rules were used, the golden goal has never been used in, in any event um, of a draw match in the knockout stages of any competition. Uh, the rule is still utilised in college soccer, I most recently decided the 2013 Women's Championship game and 2017 Men's Championship game. Yeah, the silver goal sounds a bit pointless. It's one of those in theory that kind of works in gr like really, really well, but doesn't actually work that well practically. Um, as you said, the sides remains too defensive when they mm. had those rules. So you yeah. can see why they would bring it in for that excitement, but it kind of had a negative impact. Do you know what I would like to see? <laughs> what's that just? so I watched an old MLS video and uh, it were like penalty, it was penalty shootouts oh, yeah, with the, yeah. where I was like, going to include that it's kind of a to, to look at like a quirky the 1v1 penalty shootout they're so good yeah I quite like them so not to go back to ice hockey but they have these shootouts in ice hockey where they start at the halfway line and go forward the difference in that sport is that the goals are much smaller and it's much, diff much more difficult to score yeah. so if you're shooting from range you're unlikely to score if it's just you on the ice in football, obviously, that's different, but they're absolutely crazy. I mean, players tend to try and go around the goalkeeper, don't they? Mm. Um, in these examples that I've seen, or they just try and lob them, and it is really exciting. Yeah, I missed the beat, said a nice hockey, but yeah, the football bit, yeah, uh, very much so. It's important. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and with the silver goal, they were trying to bridge the gap and trying to like find that kind of compromise for the footballing community that mm. were against the golden goal rule because it was just seen as too 
too conclusive mm. for the reasons I've mentioned in terms of the goals that were fortuitous or incorrect. But in theory, though, it's still the same thing still applies if a goal is scored in, say, 114th minute. So, yeah, sure. And the difference is then, a go- say a goal is scored in the 114th minute, they have a minute to capitalise. But if it's scored in the 116th minute, then they've got 40 minutes to capitalise. So it's quite a stark difference between when that goal is scored. So I think the discussion that this topic um, generates is whether these rule changes are actually necessary to improve the game or should we leave it the game as it is, a proven successful model. Um, and the other significant rule changes I can think of from recent years, perhaps, we also obviously had the uh, pass-back rule that came out in like 92, um, just after the, Euro, the Euros and Denmark's win. But then we've had over time, I think in the two, in early 2000s, the late 2000s, we had members of the offside rule. So it used to be that any player who was offside when the ball was played, we had to bring that back. But then it changed to any player that is interfering would yeah. then be offside. Um, we've had amendments to the last man rule in recent seasons where it's only a red card. Um, if, a last man, if the last man brings down an attacker, it's only a red card if it's a goal scoring opportunity and it's a professional foul, as opposed to it just being a... Um, goal scoring opportunity we've had the handball in the box which has seen some controversy during VAR um, we've had the fifth official come in um, in European competitions namely in the Champions League and Europa mm. and Europa League where he stands behind the goal very awkwardly and pretends to make make decisions um, we've obviously seen VAR come in and it's been very con- controversial which is not necessarily a, obviously an actual rule change of the sport but it's meant to help officiate the sport but mm. it's still a significant um, impact on how the game runs and how it flows um, and we've also seen things like goalkeepers and penalty saves, how they can't come off the line. And there's so much that gets tweaked every year. I mean, the kickoff rule is actually one of the better ones where you don't have to you don't have to pass it forwards. Yeah, yeah. You have you can just pass it back, which makes a lot more sense. And it's been one of the more like logical and better tweaks. But at the end of the day, is that really necessary? Does it have to do we have to tweak every every year? So IFAB meet twice a year, once to discuss rule changes in the sport, yeah. and once to discuss internal issues. Yeah. And it begs the question, well, they're not going to meet and not change a rule, are they? Yeah. It defeats the purpose of the organisation. So we're always going to see rule changes, which are either going to be logical like the kickoff rule or just going to be kind of interfering and not necessarily positive. So it begs the question of can we just leave the sport alone or do we need these constant rule changes to keep up with the pace of the game, perhaps, and the changing kind of demands of the fan and, and things like that? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, the game has to continuously evolve. Yeah. It can't, it can't stand still. And it's done that throughout the years, as you highlighted. So the offside rule, it used to have to be three men between the attacker for you to be offside. Then it became two and then it became one, as you know it today. Mm. Um, the future of offside rules could be looking at um, electronic cameras to monitor when someone's offside. Yeah. Apparently the sponsors of the goal line technology or the owners, sorry. It's Hawkeye. Hawkeye, yeah. yeah. I've been looking into that. Um, if we don't do that, we then tend to fall behind other sports where technology is massive and they've made huge changes to mm. that. So like cricket and rugby in particular. Yeah. Um, so if it's important that football doesn't stop st- or stand still because then it will fall behind. However, does that ruin certain aspects of what made people fall in love with the sport to begin mm. with? Like debating controversial ref decisions Um or should people kind of not look at that and just look at trying to adapt to what's more of a new normal? Mm. And the VAR argument is very interesting because I think the argument against VAR coming in was that, while obviously there were errors because you're officiated by humans and you're going to get errors, yeah. the level of officiating is still really high. I mean, to be a referee and you've got, I don't know, you've got Mane, Saleh, who are breaking the line yeah. and the, you could get played against a City team with a high defensive line and they're breaking through at some serious speed. Or someone like Adama Traore, who was so quick, and they're having to put their, they're having to, and you've seen the sort of margins for error that VAR yeah. brings out in offsides. They're having to make that decision. It's very difficult, and it obviously creates an, an argument in favour of VAR, and saying, well, if it's yeah. so difficult, yeah, let's make some, let's make it easier. And a lot of the officials are in favour of it because it takes the burden off them. Mm. Um, but I, I always, while I get why technology is used not just in football but other sports because. It does take that pressure off, and there's also a lot riding on these games in yeah. terms of you know, points, financials. I was always a big fan of the status quo, and so when VAR came in, while I saw the benefits, I thought, well, what are we changing here? Is it really going to make a? Fun- Is the change going to be good enough to really warrant the massive changes that have came in? Yeah, true. Obviously, things like 
we take for granted that all these rules have always been around, such as like yellow cards, red cards, yep. the foul rules, the substitution rules. They didn't. And so the fact that we have these owes itself to having this sort of committee and these constants kind of reviews of the game, which have got it to where it is today. Yeah. So to take that away would then to an extent undermine that. So imagine a game without offsides. Imagine a game where the back pass rule doesn't exist anymore, yeah. where there's no yellow and red cards. It'd be like that game, red card on PS4. I don't know if you had it, but you just, <laughs> so you could play as like dolphins. It was a bit mad, but <laughs> but like there's no rules and it was quite fun, but it's just, it's it's at the same time, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting one. Um, purists are always going to be against rule changes, but I think as you said, and as I touched on, the game has to evolve with the appetite of fans, the demand, and how the game changes in terms of pace. Agreed. Thank you for tuning in to this week's Why Football podcast and thank you, Dryden, for the, doing the information. No problem. Before we go, please don't forget to follow us on Twitter at YFootball underscore for our latest content. Please also remember to follow and subscribe with us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and SoundCloud for immediate access to our future episodes. Nice. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Cheers.